reading. Good afternoon or good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, welcome. My name is Michael Berry. I'm director of the Center for Chinese Studies here at UCLA. And this is our part of our regular lecture series. It's my great honor to welcome everyone here. Thank you for joining us online. And we've had a really exciting series of lectures over the last couple of months, and we have a lot of uh, events coming up very soon. We have a new initiative with the Taiwan Academy, and we're going to be hosting a number of writers, uh, artists from Taiwan over the next couple of months, including Bai Xianyong, the well-known writer. So please, if you're not already a subscriber, log on to the Center for Chinese Studies website and you can sign up for our mailing list to uh, get information on future events. For today, I'm going to turn the moderating duties over to my colleague in the history department, Professor Arbin Wang, who is distinguished professor of history. He's the author of China Transformed, co-author of Before and Beyond Divergence and many other articles, books, edited volumes. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Wang who will be introducing our speaker and moderating today's session. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and hello everyone, morning, evening, afternoon, wherever, whatever. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Andrew, Professor Andrew Liu uh, of Villanova University. Uh, Andy is an assistant professor who did his uh, PhD at Columbia University. I believe if I remember correctly, um, a student uh, principal advisor, Maddie Zellin, but someone who studied in that fertile atmosphere of Columbia and uh, the new uh, history <coughs> of capitalism and um, a, a global history of capitalism and other things that have uh, developed at that institution and led the Eastern Seaboard. And of course, Philadelphia is is a near mid-Atlantic uh, connection. So I assume uh, Professor Leo still feels quite at home in his, uh, his current digs. Um, so this afternoon, I'm, we're going to get treated to a presentation of his recent book, Tea War, A History of Capitalism in China and India. For those of us who are China scholars, as I suspect many of us are, uh, it is a treat to have a book that explicitly engages not merely China in some broader context, but systematically puts it into a comparison that um, uh, explores some important features of what takes place in 19th century India as well. So without further ado, I turn it over to Professor Liu. All right, great. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for attending uh, during what is, I'm sure a very busy and weird time for everyone, uh, wherever you are. Thank you to the UCLA Center for Chinese Studies. Thank you to Michael Berry and Esther for the invitation. Uh, sorry. My uh, AC system might be a little loud. Uh, and thanks, of course, to Bin, Bin Wang for agreeing to comment. Um, so the last time I did one of these Zoom talks about my book was uh, a few months ago. It was actually, I was just thinking about this yesterday. It was the day after the election, which you can recall, nothing was settled at the time. And so when I gave that talk, I was very sleep deprived. And I think it might have been a good talk. It might have been a bad talk. But the point is, I really have no memory whatsoever of giving that talk about my book. So yesterday when I was trying to prepare for today's talk, I, I really had no memory of what I had said last time. And I kind of felt like I had to write this talk from scratch. So uh, in theory, that might be a good thing to, to kind of write something organically rather than memorizing something from a few months ago. Um, but today, uh, uh, appropriately enough, I guess I'll, I'm happy to uh, give this talk to launch the Biden administration, to launch a new future and hopefully uh, the optimism in the air will, 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 uh, will carry over to the talk itself. Um, so I won't talk about everything in the book it, itself, of course. I want to, we don't have enough time to kind of engage in all the specific details, but I do want to focus on some of the key themes and takeaways of the book and uh, highlight some of the points that are not necessarily controversial, but would make for a good conversation, right? And I know there are a few points that um, Ben was interested in talking about uh, in particular, so I also will kind of spend more time highlighting some of those themes and then some of those questions. Um, so the book itself, uh, I have a copy with me right here. The, the big picture, the themes of the book, um, some of the categories that could help the audience members locate it within scholarship um, uh, include the fact that, well, we could start with the fact that, you know, this book is, it's a global and comparative history of the tea trades and the tea industries of China and India from the 19th to the 20th century, All right? So that's just like the simplest 
tagline for what this book is about. Uh, and the question that kind of consumed me starting in the, you know, in graduate school and revising this dissertation to a book. So for over a decade at this point, I guess, is this question of how do you write a history of capitalism in this part of the world, right? And we're talking about the rural hinterlands of Asia, the rural hinterlands of the Chinese, the tea districts of China, the tea uh, plantations of India. How do you write a history of capitalism about uh, for these parts of the world um, through a type of conceptualization that is also broad enough to encompass all sorts of different kind of social formations, right? So uh, a conception of capitalism that can account for the sort of classical story of the rise of the West, but also account for the sort of rest of the world. Um, but at the same time, a conception that is also agile and versatile and flexible enough to deal with the sort of specific details of what exactly is happening in China, what exactly is happening in India, and potentially many other places, right, in the post-colonial or, you know, what we could also call the rest of the world. Um, so this led me to spend a lot of time over the last decade or so thinking about um, how can we conceptualize capitalism in a way that is rigorous, that is intellectually consistent and honest, right? Not fitting theory to history, history to theory in a very simplistic way. And, and also a, a conceptualization that is adequate to global history, adequate to the moment we're living in. And, and I'll say more about that in a moment. Um, but I think you can immediately see, you know, how this work or where this work should be placed within a few directions of scholarship over the last several years. Um, first off, it is very obviously it's a it's a history that is interested in connections and comparisons. It is you know it's transnational, it's global, it's comparative. All these sort of uh, categories that are out there that are all kind of share in common a critique of uh, the nation state or a critique of methodological nationalism. Right, thinking about different units of analysis to move beyond taking you know China as a static subject of history or India or England or or the United States. Um, so that's one, one kind of clear direction of scholarship. And the other one is that um, this, this book is also my attempt to try to speak to a resurgent interest in the United States Academy, at least, of something called the history of capitalism um, that, you know, Ben had briefly referenced, right? And this is a phenomenon for those of you uh, who are not historians, um, you know, or, but have probably heard of this, that this is something that's kind of come out of the 2008 financial crisis, uh, real interest in historicizing this institution, called capitalism, but it's primarily thus far been done by and for students of history in the North Atlantic, right? The United States in particular, but also uh, Western Europe. Um, pre predominantly interested in, for instance, histories of slavery and enslaved labor in the United States, but also, you know, financial institutions in Western Europe and the international, the international system of the 20th century. Um, thus far, um, it's not really, this conversation has not really dealt with places like China, India, or Asia, and the rest of the world. But I do think that you know we shouldn't be com complaining or consigned about uh, 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 resigned to our fate or anything. I think this is actually a good opportunity. This is providing good uh, language uh, to connect the scholarship uh, and have a conversation uh, between those who work on you know our, uh, China and, and India and Asia with the rest of the world. But you know that might be a bit optimistic. We'll see where the conversation goes. But this book, I think, is certainly an attempt to kind of engage that interest. And the other thing to kind of briefly mention is that you know this this book is it's China and the rest of the world, but it's not just China in Europe or China in the West, right? This is explicitly a consciously an attempt to think about China's connection to other parts of the colonial or post-colonial colonial world. In this case, India. And there, are, I think there are a lot of benefits to moving beyond the sort of east-west paradigm to think about lateral connections between um, or across these sort of non-European societies, such that you don't get these sort of reductive statements about in the west things are like this, in the rest of the world things are like this. There's a lot of differences, but also a lot of overlap between the history of China and India at this at this moment in time. And I think you know, for anyone who's studied the 19th to the 20th century, uh, these connections come up all the time, right? And I think it's it would be good to explore these further, and we could talk about sort of the potential, uh, the potential of the openings that are opened up uh, from taking that approach. Um, okay, so let me begin before kind of delving even further uh, into these kind of meta theoretical questions. Let me just kind of give a basic, kind of walk us through the plot, right, of the story of this history, so that we kind of know where we are, what time, and, and uh, who who is doing what, right? So the 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 point of departure for this book is the first Opium War, right, 1839 to 1842, um, which, you know, I think most of us are aware was not just this British 
Chinese war, but it actually uh, emerged out of this triangle trade that also involved colonial India, right? So there was this trade triangle where British manufactured goods go to India, Indian opium, opium goes to China, Chinese tea goes back to, uh, to Western Europe, into the UK. And even before the opium war breaks out, tea has become a wildly popular commodity in Western Europe um, in combination with, and especially in combination with cane sugar that has grown in the West Indies, right? These Caribbean plantations that are managed and owned by European powers, uh, relying upon enslaved African labor, right? So from the very beginning, tea is plugged into these global networks of commodities, a very diverse production, a labor and social social formations around the world. And that is kind of a theme I wanna to continue to explore uh, going forward with the book. Uh, now the opium war itself, uh, you know, if you think about how was it justified, how was it, how was it articulated by British officials? The argument was that uh, this war was be is being fought to liberalize the Qing monopoly on trade, right? The Canton system, very famously in Guangzhou in Southern China. Um, at the same moment in the 1830s and 40s, East India Company officials in this Northeast newly acquired Northeast territory of Assam are trying to start a sort of their own tea industry, colonial tea industry. And they use the exact same language uh, the, of militaristic language of trying to annihilate the Qing monopoly by emulating their tea industry, right? So the argument I kind of, the conclusion I sort of reach is that the establishment of Indian tea was the opium war by other means. Uh, and so from that, from that moment onwards in the 1840s and 1850s, we have um, the creation of the Indian tea industry and hopefully everyone can see this, right? So this is uh, a chart of the major tea producing regions by the turn of the 20th century. And the major ones in China that produce uh, tea for the rest of the world are kind of this stretch of land here uh, that I talk about in the book, uh, Anhui province and Fujian province in the Southeast, and then Assam in Northeast India. Now there's also of course the Dutch East Indies, there's Ceylon, there's Japan. Those eventually matter a great deal, but at the beginning of the story, it's really a China India story at first. So the title Tea War kind of has a multiple meanings, right? The first is a sort of play on the idea of an opium war, that tea is actually economic competition through tea is sort of the opium war by other means, right? It's through the, through the trade in tea. Um, the other meaning though, and the thing that I actually explore throughout the rest of the book is what happens over the course of the next century, where from the 1840s onwards, we have the Chinese tea industry that's really liberalized, has liberalized trade, uh, exports from Qing China to the rest of the world really explode. And you also have this nascent colonial Indian tea industry that by the 1860s and 70s also emerges and they're pitted into this very fierce direct competition with each other for the global marketplace. By the 1880s and 1890s, both the British officials and planters, as well as the Chinese merchants and officials, they are conceptualizing this competition in tea through the same kind of militaristic metaphors. Um, so the tea, the, the phrase tea war comes from a British planter who talks about the tea war that has been waged with China, right, up until this point in the 1880s, 1890s. And it's around the same moment that in Chinese, in Chinese uh, intellectual thinking, the famous kind of political economic thinker, uh, Zhang Guanying, very famously comes up with this phrase, right, Shangzhan, commercial warfare in the 1890s, um, to, to kind of describe the, the competition in tea, but also silk, the major export goods out of Qing China at the time. So for me, there's something interesting about the fact that, you know, these writers are, of course, not talking to each other, but they are both independently arriving at this discourse that mirrors one another, that economic competition is a kind of warfare that they have to participate in. Um, and it's a kind of battle. It's not just trade. It's not this sort of placid process of, you know, trade that reaches an equ equilibrium, it's this actually militaristic, fierce, competitive battle. And so this led me to kind of uh, believe or come up with the argument that uh, ultimately then uh, the subject of this book, right, isn't just the, the, the subject of the Chinese, Chinese tea trade, the Indian tea trade, the subject is this process of competition itself, this transnational process of competition. Um, it's a process that is worth kind of focusing on its own terms, a mutually determinative process, where both sides are kind of uh, kind of fighting each other through this back and forth. Uh, and it involves Chinese subjects, British subjects, Indian subjects, but they're playing different roles and they have different relationships to one another throughout this, throughout the course of this history. So it's by tracking and kind of foregrounding this process of competition that I think we can understand the process, it's this, the historical transformations themselves better, um, and also kind of understand like what is the actual relationship 
that uh, the transnational relationship that is connecting India with China at this time. And part of this, you know, methodologically was my kind of wrestling with this question of units of analysis, right? How do you do, you do this as a national history? Uh, well, if you do a national history, then you're going to kind of exclude the other half of the story. Do you do this as a sort of all-encompassing world history? Well, if you, world histories tend to be uh, almost, too, almost too broad and too vague, and they kind of flatten all these different particularities uh, and the sort of dynamic changes over time. So the argument I make is that, or the argument that, you know, drawing from um, others who've written about this is that uh, the, if, if we kind of allow the object of analysis, the unit of analysis itself to emerge out of the historical process, then this can help us kind of uh, pay greater attention or, or to write a history that is more adequate, right, to understanding the nature of, in this particular case, capitalist competition as a driver, uh, as a driver of change in this, in this moment in time. So I can say more about that later, but you know, obviously this is like you get into very like abstract theoretical talk that we can try to try to uh, cap at this point. And the last plot point here is that by the 1890s, the colonial Indian tea industry has toppled its Chinese competitors. This is just a basic chart showing the sort of right the sort of crisscrossing that happens by the 1880s, 1890s. And this is a shocking development, especially for those in China, the Qing officials, as well as the Chinese merchants, who up until, until this point, it was unimaginable for them to lose their market share uh, to the Indian tea industry, which they were barely even aware of at this time. Why does Indian tea succeed and why does Chinese tea you know, collapse at this time? Well, there were a lot of explanations that emerged at the time and subsequent historians have tried to explain it as well. Um, and you can kind of, it's kind of not that much of a surprise that a lot of those explanations uh, sort of are rely upon these very stereotype, stereotypical descriptions of what is wrong with China at this time. And conversely, what is going so well for Europe and, and the British empire at this time. Uh, even though the Indian tea industry is in India, it's an Asian tea industry, it, would, it is seen by its, you know, its champions and the planters and the organizers as a European, a British invention. So you have these very um, predictable kind of West is best type of explanations, you, I dare say great divergence explanations, that Indian tea thrived because it was rational and scientific and modern and civilized. Chinese tea fails because it's traditional, it's pre-modern, it's pre-capitalist, it's irrational, right? Um, and so in trying to sort out this explanation or this argument about why Indian tea succeeds and Chinese tea fails, we're also kind of delving into the broader meta question about uh, kind of Asian studies in the 20th century, or Orientalist uh, explanations, Orientalist views of China in the 20th century. So at the time, you have these images, these are uh, kind of advertisements or propaganda being disseminated by the British planters of the Indian tea industry, um, who kind of, you know, kind of like nice, funny, uh, racist little imagery shows the Chinese uh, merchants being, uh, uh, be being by beaten by their Indian competitors. We have this one, which is a kind of a stunning picture, which is found in the British Library. Um, that really, again, reifies this idea that this was not a, that overall the, the global tea trade was kind of two different processes of once, right? Where India is going this direction and China is going in this direction. Um, and I think this kind of is compatible with a lot of nationalist notions of economic history or history in general, right? That 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 history is about these different units, these national units that are moving in different directions. Where I'm trying to show that actually over the same period of time, we see the Chinese tea industry, the Indian tea industry, and just you know the all the trading partners around the world are getting closer and closer, getting further and further enmeshed in these processes of competition. And that's a different way to think about this moment in time. So much of this book is an attempt to repudiate a lot of these economic orientalist explanations of Chinese stagnation. And it also gets into debates about, you know, was Indian tea capitalist, was it not capitalist, what is colonial capitalism, and so on and so forth. Um, the book kind of operates at multiple levels of analysis. The first is that it's kind of a social economic labor history of how these industries were organized. It's also a conceptual intellectual history of how these ideas of backwardness emerged in the first place, of Asian backwardness emerged within culture. Um, and I argue that, you know, that up until the kind of the end of the 19th century, or starting with the end of the 19th and turn, at the turn of the 20th century, we, we begin to see these particular tropes and metaphors to describe China and India and Asia more generally as backwards. And those tropes are always kind of viewing those particular societies, right, as, as, as very particular and traditional. But the paradox, I argue, is that these particular, these notions of particularity 
are the result of these very globally global uh, global connections that are very dynamic, right? So we have particular ideas of about Asian tradition that are the result of global and dynamic historical processes. So that's sort of the paradox, um, that the sort of punchline of the argument, uh, that in order to explain how China becomes seen as backwards in India in its own way, we have to actually account for the global processes that are underlying them. Um, I mentioned briefly ab above that, you know, competition is a central argument of the book that we that competition can help us kind of reorganize thinking about this moment in history, uh, this moment of history, reorganize thinking about economic history. Um, and as such, the book itself is actually organized, trying to mirror, emulate that process of competition itself. It's a kind of, uh, I, I organize it through sort of back and forth structure where we have a chapter on China, where China rises, we have a chapter on India where India rises, a chapter on China where China responds to the rise of India and so on and so forth. Um, and the goal is to kind of help to give the reader a sense of how this isn't just a story that can be uh, understood from one part of the world. It has to, we have to actually jump back and forth because it's a, the competition itself is a process of a kind of back and forth mutual, uh, mutual comp uh, mutually constitutive dynamics. So as I say in the introduction, quote, competition is not just the framing, but also my argument for how best to understand the dynamics of capitalism. And also finally, just to kind of give you a sense of the scale uh, of tea and why and the significance of tea, why does this matter? Well, tea was definitely big business at the time in case you know, there was any doubt. Chinese tea, aside from its cultural significance and the sort of impetus behind, let's say the, the first opium war, uh, tea was by far the most exported commodity from China in the 19th century in terms of volume and in terms of overall value. Um, in, within the Indian economy, the, as, uh, insofar as, as it existed, Tea represented the most amount of registered companies, the most overseas investment. Um, and by the 1920s and 30s, I think this is, uh, you know, the, the numbers are a little bit uh, unstable at this time, but by the 20s and 30s, when you have these first sort of industrial employment surveys, I believe it's true that uh, tea represented more official uh, employees, workers uh, in China and in India than any of the comparable industries in, in their time, right? So there were more people working in tea than in silk or in cotton or in coal mining or any of these sort of uh, major commodities in this part of the world. So really tea, I think it seems, it kind of goes without saying that tea is central to any question about what was the nature of capitalism in China? What was the nature of capitalism in India at this time, at this point in, in time? So this leads me to the, the kind of, um, one of the major questions I wanted to address and uh, I know this is a question that Ben was also curious about discussing because I know he's written about this as well, which is, you know, the question of capitalism, the question of how do we conceptualize it, how do we think about it in a different way, and what is what am I trying to do in this book? Um, and I spend a lot of time, again, as I as I mentioned, kind of thinking about well, how is capitalism as a concept, as a process, as a historical period, how is it conceptualized in past economic histories, Chinese history, world history, European history, and uh, Trying to come up to come 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 up with or or conclude with what I found to be the most persuasive conceptualization. I should also say anecdotally that when I turned in the draft to for the manuscript to be reviewed, I had actually never I kind of kind of dodged the question right of 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 defining or uh, articulating what I meant by capitalism. A reviewer said you should probably if you're going to use the word so much, you should actually tell us what you mean by it. And I thought, okay, well, um, I, I didn't, I didn't really want to, but I guess I have to. Um, but the, the, the end result is this is kind of the last thing I wrote, right? Kind of thinking about what, what was my argument and how do I can, how do I kind of uh, conceptualize in a way that's hopefully clear for the reader. And I want to kind of preface what I mean or how I'm thinking about capitalism by briefly talking about what's already out there, the sort of classic conception of it within economic historiography. Um, among economic historians, you're going to find a lot of different frameworks for understanding what capitalism means. There's the sort of orthodox Marxist, there's a sort of Karl Polanyan, Adam Smithian, neoclassical models. Um, but most of them treat capitalism, this question of capitalism, as a problem of how do you get to industrialization? Industrialization is kind of seen as the apotheosis of the, so the end, end all be all of what this is, uh, the, the question of capitalism is about. And it's often organized around this question uh, in national terms. How do you get to English industrialization, American industrialization, Chinese industrialization? Um, and one of the features that does seem to be shared in common across these frameworks is that capitalism is about the commodification 
you know, the placing of, on the marketplace of all the important factors of production, right? So land, uh, capital or money, but especially labor, right? Proletarianization has always been seen as a sort of benchmark uh, of modern capitalist societies. The famous argument is that uh, England had proletarianization. This led to English industrialization before anybody else. And that is, this is sort of the hallmark for why, uh, for, for what makes a society capitalist. Famously within Chinese history, Mark Elvin and Philip Huang and many others have argued that the lack of proletarianization was why China never developed, right? And this is one, um, this is from an article that uh, from Shahid Amin and Marcel van der Linden very early on kind of identifying these tropes within sociology and economic history that saw that, that, that assumed that capitalist labor has to be what Marx called right, doubly free labor, neither unfree nor independent, right? So this is a problem if we think about the Chinese uh, or the Chinese, the world tea and the world tea uh, market, because the two main producers, right, China and India, well, Indian tea production relied upon what was known as indentured penal contract based labor that was definitely unfree by modern standards. And Chinese tea relied upon, um, if, as we know from Chinese historiography, right, smallholder peasantry who kind of performed a little bit of labor on the side um, and were market dependent, but were also kind of only semi independent or semi proletarianized. So as a result, you know, the classic historiography has kind of assumed both Chinese tea and Indian tea, or neither of them were capitalists, right? Because neither of them were uh, characterized by proletarian labor. And yet we know, right, that uh, as I just mentioned, these were massively profitable um, industries that were plugged into global networks of commodity, capital accumulation and, co and, and commodity trade. So there's a real sort of disjuncture between this a very English Anglo-centric definition of capitalism and world history itself, right? So um, let me stop. I don't have any more slides for a moment. So let me briefly just go back to this screen. Um, so we have this model of capitalism that's very much this kind of linear path based on the English experience and the American experience where firms or producers are getting richer, bigger, more automated, more complicated. Um, and this model is useful in a lot of ways, but in my view, it's kind of one-sided. Um, and there are two, in my view, kind of shortcomings with this kind of linear model of capitalism as modern, as basically industrialization. Then the first is it doesn't really tell us about what's going on in the parts of the world that don't fit into this model. And specifically, it doesn't tell us about what's going on in Asia in the 19th century and much of the rest of the world, of the post-colonial world at this time. Um, and by extension, I don't think it really accounts for the world we live in today. Uh, where we know if you paid attention uh, to you know, econ economic transformations in the last half century, we are increasingly living in a, if not Asian centric, uh, a world where Asia is a center uh, of, a global, of the global economy and firms and production in that part of the world very often is very small scale, flexible, labor intensive and network based and transnational in organization in a way that really defies the older models. Now, the point isn't that we have to throw away those older models. The point is, I think we have to have a conceptualization of capitalism that can account for many different phases, many different eras, and many different places and times within the broader history of capitalism, right? So to account for capitalism uh, in different phases, historians talk about the classical phase, the industrial phase, the laissez-faire phase, the uh, sort of protectionist phase, the neoliberal phase, right? Um, and we need not necessarily a flat description of what capitalism looks like, but perhaps a syntax or a toolbox to, under, to explain all the different moves uh, that have occurred within capitalism's history. So that's kind of one objection. The other objection is that um, when economic historians have tended to view capitalism, when they've tried to talk about it, they've tried to think about it in what I call technicist terms, right? Where capitalism is the discussion about techniques, right? How do we get to better and better techniques? How do we have the, how do we get steam engines? How do we get to, you know, fossil fuel based production? How do we get to, you know, monopoly managerial firms and so on? Um, and again, that's a very useful inquiry, but I think that type of inquiry often will take for granted this underlying social objective of why are people aiming to raise productivity in the first place? Uh, rarely do we get an account of like, well, why are they trying to build a steam engine? Why are people trying to technologically innovate? Uh, and without an explanation of that, then I, th I think very often we fall into this trap of making uh, sort of ahistorical or primordial explanations about capitalism as human nature, right? So that's the sort of another objection. Mm -hmm. 
So by contrast, the argument I'm trying to make or that I try to make in this book is that we can historicize the underlying social dynamics of modern capital accumulation that can also account for the drive towards industrialization, but it can also go in many other different directions as well, depending upon sort of the time and place of, of, the, place of, of the object of analysis we're looking at. The rise of capitalism entails a process in which everyday economic life is increasingly organized around the purchase and sale of human labor, taking on the form of commodities, right? Corresponding to this then is a sort of intellectual or conceptual shift where we begin to see wealth and riches no longer simply tied to agriculture or trade, which are the kind of the oldest ideas that are found around the world, but they are instead being tied to a generalized concept of human labor. Once uh, wealth is tied to human labor, then this idea that uh, then, the, then it becomes an imperative to uh, increase the productivity of human labor as well. So the social dynamic that aims towards the increasing the productivity of human labor uh, translates into these social pressures to make things to make production more efficient, to make distribution more efficient, to make to cut costs everywhere, right? And here, of course, I think this again the process of in terms of how do we understand this empirically, how do we do historical research on this? The process of competition is really crucial to the expansion and, intensif and intensification of these social dynamics around the world. Now, what I've just said, I admit is very abstract, um, but that kind of the point, right, that a capitalism is ultimately a very abstract system that's very flexible, and it can take on very many different forms, very, very many different concrete forms. Um, so again, it, 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 what, what this points to is a conception of capitalism that is very uneven, that sometimes it does lead to the sort of classic industrial stories of Victorian Britain or post-war United States, but also it takes on these other kind of diverse forms of, let's say, um, unfree plantations, small workshops, domestic labor that are also found all throughout the last few centuries of economic history. Um, I've, I write about this in the introduction and I've said this in a few different articles that this conception I've just kind of outlined is drawing upon a certain rereading of Marx's capital that has uh, become kind of dominant from the 1970s onwards. But by no means do I view, view it as a kind of closed model. I think of it as a sort of open, uh, baseline or, or uh, point of departure of analysis. And by no means is this a consensus among Marxist historians and Marxist theorists, they disagree with each other all the time. But this is the, this is the conception that I find very persuasive. So the implications, what are the implications of this for China or, or for Asian history more generally? Well, it means that capitalism cannot just be reduced to proletarianization. Uh, it, is, it does depend upon market dependent labor, but that can take many different forms. Uh, in the earliest eras of capitalism, we're gonna, we, we often see that capitalist labor was not free proletarian labor as in England. It was you know, unfree labor, seasonal labor, casual labor, gender, paternalistic, patriarchally organized labor, domestic labor, labor, indentured labor, and so on. So really the, the, the opposite of the proletarian ideal type that is presupposed in a lot of these models. Um, a lot of I gained a lot of insight by looking at the specific historiography, historiographies of South Asia, where historians such as Jairus Banaji, and even Dipesh Chakrabarti, right in his first book, talk about these sort of abnormal labor types that fueled the rise of South Asian capitalism. In East Asian history, we have, of course, you know, the professor, work of Professor Professor Wong, Kenneth Pomerantz, Kaoru Sugihara, talking about labor-intensive forms of uh, capitalist production that give us, uh, uh, well, altogether, I think all, what all these scholars are, are working towards, even if they're coming from different perspectives, is articulating the theoretical possibility for a non-Eurocentric version of modern capitalist dynamics that, again, I think are increasingly relevant um, in the 21st century, and especially if you study the world beyond you know, the North Atlantic. Um, so what does this leave us in terms of writing this history of capitalism in, in, in a place like China and India and the, the history of the, the tea industries there? The task then becomes writing a history of capitalism on peasant farms, on tea plantations, without these recognizable signs of progress, uh, the typical ones you find in economic history of mechanization, of technological innovation, these kind of charts of rising GDP over time, those don't exist right, in these stories that, that I write about in this book. So we have to get a little bit creative and look for other ways to write a history of these emergent social dynamics without kind of being able to point to this very clear, you know, example of here's a, here's a steam engine uh, to prove that there was capitalism, right? 
So as I mentioned earlier, this is really relying upon a combination of social labor history, looking at these social dynamics in practice, but also an intellectual conceptual history. How do these dynamics give way to new concepts and, and new ways of thinking about the world by Chinese thinkers, Indian thinkers, and also British colonial thinkers? So let me briefly talk a little bit about how, uh, just like talk about a little bit about how, how, this, uh, how this works uh, with a few anecdotes from the book, right? So in terms of the labor process, you know, one of the sort of interesting anecdotes that I talk about is the way that tea production gets organized in these workshops in Southern Anhui province, one of the major tea producing provinces, or tea producing areas in China. Um, now tea is grown on these smallholder farms, these private farms, but every tea season starting around April, uh, these seasonal workshops emerge and they kind of hire migrant labor uh, that are probably just kind of part-time workers uh, who they do own their own property, but during tea season, they work in these workshops to earn some extra income, right? So they're not proletarian uh, in the classic sense, but they do kind of merge upon the, uh, converge upon these sort of William Skinner-esque market towns to work in these workshops. Um, and the one thing I discovered was in these uh, Anhui-based workshops, right? They have a very disciplined work schedule where they're trying to pump out as much tea as possible in a given amount of time. To do so, they use a specific kind of timekeeping device to monitor how productive every worker is. The timekeeping device are incense sticks, right? Sort of traditional incense sticks that are used for religious cultural purposes, but I've increasingly discovered there are many industries in the Chinese speaking world or in East Asia that use incense sticks as kind of timekeeping devices for labor as well. So they come up with these very precise instructions to make tea, you have to roll it, you have to roast it, you have to package it, given you know half a stick of incense or the time it takes to burn one and a half sticks of incense and so forth. Um, they use these incense sticks to create a reward system, for, you know, rewarding people for working quicker than average, punishing people for working slower than average. Very modern ways of using this this technology. And the argument then is that this, from a very basic standpoint, this the physical uh, material qualities of this timekeeping technology is very primitive, traditional, pre-modern, whatever you want to call it, right? But they're being used in very modern ways, owing to the fact that they're now being plugged into these abstract uh, global forces of competition. And to me, this is very emblematic of the way that capitalism, the history of capitalism is animated by these examples of incorporating so-called traditional pre-existing technologies, institutions, class relations, um, but repurposing them towards this goal, this very basic goal of accumulation um, and, and, and raising the productivity of human labor. Um, and part of this is also an argument against the sort of technological fetishism of so much economic history that capitalism can't be uh, reduced to this or that particular technology because a lot of old technology or an old uh, stuff that just looks old and pre-modern could actually be used in very modern ways. And that, that is, I think, uh, very, um, very, a very resonant description for what I find in the, in the tea plantations of China and in India at this time. Um, so I won't get into what happened. I have, I have similar, uh, similar stories for what's happening in India at this time, some other stories in other parts of China, but that's just to give you kind of one um, taste of the kind of argument I'm making in terms of the social, social uh, history. The other aspect of this is a history of concepts, and uh, I'll get to this picture in a moment. Um, but corresponding to the social history is an, kind of a conceptual or intellectual history where I look at how, how do these British officials in colonial India, how do Indian writers themselves, Bengali writers, how do Qing officials, how do Chinese, Republican Chinese officials and merchants, how are they trying to make sense of the global tea trade and by extension, making sense of these massive transformations in the global economy? Um, and why am I doing this? How is this part of a history of capitalism? And this is a question that uh, Ben was also interested in discussing. Well, again, if one's conception of capitalism, my conception of capitalism is that it cannot be reduced to simply tracking technologies and figures and numbers. If it is actually this underlying social dynamic that encompasses these new practices, then corresponding to those new practices are going to be new concepts, new ways of thinking and talking and imagining the world. Right. So uh, the history of these new concepts, I'm not saying this history of these, the history of these concepts is the whole story, that capitalism can be reduced to an intellectual history. 
But I do think the emergence of these concepts and the fact that these concepts are resonant for Chinese uh, merchants and officials for how they make sense of the world, that's a really useful data point in tracing the emergence of these dynamics in China and in other parts of the world. Um, so across British texts, Chinese texts, and Bengali texts, Indian texts, um, I trace the emergence of the concepts that really seems to having, be having a, this, this kind of global conversation about classical political economy, the tradition of Adam Smith and onwards, but they're interpreting it in different ways given their specific context uh, in, in India and in China. And the, this history kind of plays two roles in my argument, right? The first is just to kind of index the fact that these Chinese and Indian thinkers, uh, they can make sense of these concepts that are coming from Adam Smith and David Ricardo and you know London and England and can translate them to their own specific context. That is in itself kind of a significant historical phenomenon. Beyond that, then the other argument is that by tracing these intellectual concepts, we can actually better understand different directions in the history of Chinese uh, political thought, China, in, in Indian, uh, Indian political thought at the same time. So in particular, as far as the first one goes, I'm tracing how concepts of wealth and value and in particular concepts about labor begin to emerge um, in these discussions about how does the tea trade work? Why is Indian tea successful? What does Chinese tea need to do to become successful? Um, I, trace the, I trace the fact that in these Indian, uh, in, the, in, these, in these texts written by British thinkers in India, by these Chinese Qing thinkers in China, they kind of are following a general path that has been laid out before them with classical political economy, which is to um, refute older theories about the economy that are based in agriculture or refute earlier theories that are based in trade and to really emphasize new theories about economic wealth that are based upon labor itself. And the argument is if the, the, the plausibility of theories of economic theories premised upon labor corresponds to a society that itself has, uh, where labor itself has become generalized or where labor has become commodified and available to be used in general fashion, right? So in a way that is a sort of indication that wage labor, market dependent wage labor is actually something that is animating Chinese and Indian society at this point, even if you don't have sort of the visible signs of proletarianization. But beyond that, I'm interested in tracing how these very abstract you know, admittedly very cosmological ideas are being, being translated and dealt with. The nitty gritty of these ideas are being dealt with by sort of mid-tier thinkers, right? The sort of middling British officials who are trying to figure out what's going on in the Somme by reading Smith and Edward Wakefield and Henry Maine. Or we have Qing officials who are trying to figure out what's happening in Jiangnan and the tea countries of China by reading Adam Smith and by reading John Stuart Mill and translating it to the Chinese context, right? So I think that's, that itself is an interesting intellectual exercise. And the final aspect of this, and I will, I'll talk about this only briefly because I know I've talked for a long time, is that if we actually understand and pursue this line of inquiry further, then we can actually understand, in my view, how uh, the different directions that political thought takes in China in the 20th century. And the example I give is this figure in Chinese, in Chinese political thought known as the Comprador, right? And this is an actual existing Comprador uh, in the, at the late 19th century. And the Comprador we know, like Mai Ban, Mai Ban in, in Mandarin, right, is the Chinese merchant who works and does business with European and American firms as far back as the 18th century with the Canton trade. But by the 20th century, it kind of takes on a new meaning with socialism and, and communism by the 1950s. During the years of the Canton trade in the 18th century into the late 19th century with self-strengthening and the reform movements in China, Comprador's were actually seen as um, if they weren't praised, they were at least seen as vanguards or visionaries of the treaty port economy. They were not looked down upon that much, right? By the 20th century, we know Comprador becomes a dirty word. It becomes demonized and scapegoated for all the failures of Chinese society. They are seen as these emblems of feudalism, right? And the typical explanation for why Comprador was seen so negatively during, let's say, the, the Mao era was that this was just nationalism and anti-imperialism and propaganda by the Communist Party. Now that might be true to some extent, but I also think it is this, this view, this kind of rapid shift from the Comprador as a visionary in the 1890s, a vanguard of capitalism in the 1890s, to this demonized scapegoat by the 1920s in China is so jarring and striking that it's worth figuring out what exactly happened in Chinese political thought to see this massive reversal. And I think a lot of this comes from the fact that 
a political economic vision grounded in labor had become labor and production had become so um, had gained such a consensus in Chinese political thinking that we see the valorization of labor and in particular peasant labor event or industrial labor that and the flip side of that is the demotion of commerce and finance that are now seen as subsidi subsidiary and parasitic upon industry and that is a massive reversal right from the time of the self-strengthening movement which was all about trade and in winning winning the sort of commercial warfare uh, that Sun Guanying talks about to the 20th century where it's about where trade is kind of demoted relative to industrial production um, so I think once you once you grasp that underlying inner inner transformation in political economic thinking in China, um, then a lot, a lot of that has to do with competition. A lot of that has to do with China's interactions with the rest of the world. Then they can they, they can it can help kind of shed light um, on a lot of things that are taken for granted in 20th century Chinese economic thought. Okay, so I'll I'll stop there. Let me just kind of to bring things back to the big picture, right? Obviously, some of the big takeaways or the big themes of the book is that. It is challenging a lot of Orientalist or Eurocentric categories of analysis, both through a sort of social labor historical method, but also historicizing those categories through a socially grounded intellectual history. Um, hopefully this book can um, contribute, let's say, to a, to a kind of conversation between Asian Chinese history and the, the emergent history of capitalism field, which I think should be global in, in nature, um, if not yet in practice, right? Um, and I have a few other comments maybe about the temporal relevance of this, of this book beyond the 19th and the 20th century to think about also the late 20th and early 21st century that I've already briefly referenced, right? That, that a lot of these concepts are really inspired by what's happening in the world today or rethinking capitalism in light of what's happened in Asia the last few decades. Um, that's, that's pretty clear, I think. And I, um, you know, we could talk about it more in the Q and A's, but I think I'll just kind of leave it there for now. So you know, thanks for listening and staying with me from up until this point. I should stop sharing. Uh, I think maybe Ben is still on mute. <laughs> trying to unmute. Excuse oh, me. I'm proving to be quite lame getting um, organized here. I'm trying <laughs> to get my video on as well. All right, here we go. Thank you very much, Andy. That was a wonderful talk. Um, and both the talk and the book, um, as I assume many of you are not familiar with the book, I know some of you already read it, but it is an extremely demanding book because of the range of subjects it covers, places it covers, and aspirations it expresses for, in my opinion, really linking economic history to a kind of cultural and intellectual history um, that in some ways I would say is uh, perhaps uh, almost the holy grail of what uh, historians hope they're able to uh, uh, find. Uh, it, it aspires or, or it reaffirms aspirations to the nature of history that exist in, in earlier periods of historiography, both in Europe and for that matter in China in terms of conceptualizing what history can do. And I had a tremendous challenge in thinking of what I wanted to raise about it in part, I must confess, because some of I recognize some of the topics, both because I've worked on them and because I'm part of some of my work is very much part of uh, this literature. Um, it's a book that uses the term capitalism. And the reason I think it's important that we discuss it is because this the concept of capitalism is what brought economic history back into history departments, in my opinion. It's crucial. Uh, to get after the cultural turn that we were getting people who took the cultural turn, embraced it, and um, have not uh, have uh, not really lessened their grip on it um, to grapple with what capitalism is. So the issue then of how cultural history and economic history share an agenda and how they're asking different questions and trying to elucidate different features of what they see as important. Um, is a very complicated task. So I have to admit that um, on the one hand, I cheer a lot of what uh, Professor Leo is doing, attempting to achieve as well as what he has given us um, in terms of his comparisons as an unfolding and uncovering of the ways in which uh, certainly certain actors and certain 
commentators, both in China, India, British, be they British, Chinese, or Indian, uh, were writing as they grappled at the moment with the changes they perceived, and some of whom were actually engaged in constructing and shaping the direction of those changes. So with all that said, I had to think, how can I efficiently talk about what I see as some of the, um, how I place this work historiographically, why I've, I've explained why I think it's important. I also think it has some serious, uh, at least for me, challenges uh, that leave me feeling, uh, uh, depending on um, the state of my health, either deeply uncomfortable or just uh, uh, annoyed. Uh, so let me begin. This is a work uh, that is very much in a Marxist historiographical context. And that context, very much like the non-Marxist uh, students of economic history, is concerned, as uh, Andy's comments indicated, essentially with issues of process, that is change over time, as well as with spatial scale and thus, especially with the issue of capitalism, the issue of a system or the system of the notion of a systemic scale of integration that is very much part of different accounts of how we understand 19th century history. The relationship between the 19th century and earlier centuries, which is something that has been going on among historians for the last, I'd say at least 20 or 30 years, and which is part of the shift to global history, has been very much engaged in this issue of how we get from early modern to modern. And the issue of capitalism is, is central to that question because capitalism as a concept begins in the Marxist tradition with reference to Europe and begins in the early modern period or its, its, its initial moment and place of intense scrutiny and importance intellectually is, the early, is early modern Europe. Thus the issue of transition from early modern to modern has been at stake firstly in European history and then for the rest of us who don't do European history, but who had to read all that stuff several decades ago, it became something we cared about. So I, I tend to um, be a little unhappy with Andy's characterization that that transition has not been studied by people in the China field, because I thought that a number of us had been uh, engaging that for uh, a long time. I had initially thought I'd share some of that or remind you of some of that, or I'll just point you to the AHR Forum 2002, where Ken Pomerantz and I each wrote articles introduced um, by Pat Manning, who some of you may know as a distinguished, well, an African historian who uh, went on to become a global historian, former president of uh, the AHA, and with a comment by David Ludden, more relevant to what we're talking about, David being a distinguished South Asia historian, actually um, in Andy's neighborhood in Philadelphia, uh, in New York, that axis. Um, but also then a former president of uh, AES. So very distinguished people commented on papers that Ken Pomerantz and I developed, each of which was devoted to some understanding of these transitions. I'm not gonna rehearse what Ken said or what I said, what was distinctive about each of those essays or how they're connected and how the two um, people evaluated and looked at them, but there is a literature, there is an engagement. Um, that is one convenient place in which you can see it in the book makes a sweeping claim early on that we, we uh, I won't quote it, but we, have, that we haven't done that. So I would say that certainly this book is an important contribution to that subject. Um, that certainly is the first, one of the first to take place under the influence simultaneously of uh, a reading of the great divergence literature in a sense, um, with which I, I, I find somewhat curious in some ways, but anyway, with that literature and with this engagement with what is a new history of capitalism, much of which in my opinion is uh, made distinctive by it's the effort of many of the people in that uh, strand of scholarship to want to bring in intellectual and cultural history. And one of my concerns is the degree to which one of the things powering what is a kind of global intellectual history, which is another product of um, the mid-Atlantic and Northeastern part of our uh, historical studies world, powered, I should say, by early modern Europeanists, uh, distinguished people who have PhDs in, in European history and, and, and even uh, sometimes law degrees uh, uh, and uh, with uh, uh, impeccable Ivy League uh, credentials. Uh, but the point is that 
that focus on global intellectual history is precisely on the migration of ideas that are born in Europe and looking at how they've become important consequential globally. Those are real issues and we need studies of those. The difficulty is the degree to which this project is understood to be what we compl in complete terms need to understand the modern world. Because that's, for me, that simply rehearses exactly the kind of problems that uh, Professor Leo has noted about a Eurocentric conceptualization, which doesn't, which talks then about adaptation or, or recognizing context. But what it doesn't do when it looks at other places, which is what was done first in economic history, which is why I, I'm so familiar with this topic, is that it doesn't allow what is specific to the dynamics in East Asia, in this case, conceptual, that matter to understanding how we move forward from early modern to modern. And as, he, uh, as Andy adumbrated, uh, if we want to think about modern to contemporary, I think still matter. So I think I want to briefly try to comment on that. I'm going to skip a lot of other things I wrote. I was going to do a rather ponderous historiographical review of, of the distinction between developmental perspectives and systemic. So I, I need to say a couple of things about that. Firstly, well before the new, ironically, because I'm not sure how many people have actually read these tomes, um, but there are these, uh, as some of you, certainly historians should know, there are these ponderous Cambridge histories of, and they can be of anything from Islam. Uh, most of them were originally for Europe. We have, we have them for many subjects. And I don't remember exactly what year it was commissioned, um, but there is a Cambridge history of capitalism and it is not part of this literature. It came out in 2014, that part I remember, but I don't remember when we, those of us who uh, agreed to contribute um, and the, the times we met, I, I no longer control the exact chronology, but sometime in this century, I think it was post 2000, this project got off the ground and it was developed. It has two volumes, so very briefly, this is a history of capitalism and two editors are two distinguished economists, Larry, uh, Larry Neal, uh, who's worked on um, English as well as early American, um, uh, is noted for his work on financial markets. And um, uh, why am I blocking on, on uh, I can see his face. Oh, I see Williamson. It. Yes, yes, Jeff Williamson. Jeffrey Williamson, who was one of our major um, economists on 19th century international trade, especially. In any event, those two gentlemen edited this volume. The first volume is really the history of Ep what, what Neil thought of is sort of times and places when there were episodes of capitalism. Now, I agreed to write in this volume and I said, well, but China doesn't have capitalism, even if it has a lot of what you think it has, that's not capitalism. So we disagreed on definitions. Um, I still wrote the chapter. It's still the only thing that represents China. So typical of these kind of exercises, different parts of the world each get one chapter and Europe gets multiple chapters for multiple subregions for multiple periods of time. And that's the nature of, of the organization of history actually uh, in academia in this, uh, in this country. And, and in some ways we're much better than some of our European uh, confederates. In any event, volume one is about developments and then volume two is about system. When we for so the first volume is ancient times to 1850 and the second volume is 1850 to the present. So that 1850 to the present is essentially the world uh, with which uh, Professor Leo is principally, but not exclusively, but principally focused upon, 1854. And for that, we have no development. We have a single system. It's the system of capitalism. And what I want to point out is that economists in general hate the term capitalism because they don't know what it is. And Andy also gave an indication of why that is. He noted that he didn't really grapple with defining it himself until the first round of reviewers comments said, it'd be a good idea if you're gonna use this concept to tell us what you mean by it. Because we all know that capitalism historiographically has had meanings as narrow as to say, the only place that had capitalism was Britain to the notion that capitalism is this global systemic system that embraces multiple parts with multiple features. So in any event, um, and, and thus, there's no easy way to talk about what we mean by capitalism. That's why I asked him to make sure he addressed it. And I thought he did a wonderful job of explaining how he understands the term and how he uses it. 
What I want to suggest, however, is the tension between system and development is present in many work and works, and I would argue it's, it is in this book as well, in the following sense, that largely we learn about China's incorporation into capitalism. And in fact, for me, um, all of us have known this ever since Emmanuel Wallerstein's modern world system um, approach. Well, if we didn't know it before then or believe that before then, but for China in the 19th century, we certainly learned it in Wallerstein 1974 and the subsequent works in that series and the other things Emmanuel, Emmanuel Wallerstein and, and others um, associated with his kind of theory presented. Now, that's just one example I presented because it's one out of the Marxist tradition. Um, but certainly we thought of, uh, uh, of China as being part of cap a capitalist system by the 19th century. Uh, for Emmanuel, it was, uh, well, Emmanuel Wallerstein, it was of the periphery, but we knew that kind of labor was in, in capitalism. We knew it wasn't proletarian, but when Philip Wong and others said China didn't have proletarian labor, they were interested in capitalism as a process of development, not the system within which it appears. And thus, um, I'm not saying I agree with either Wallerstein or Huang on all sorts of things, but I'm noting that taxonomically, they're, they're, they're focused on different features of what they think capitalism is. And the point is capitalism, and, and I'm saying the Cambridge history of capitalism, as one kind of capitalism for pre-1850 and one other for post-1850. My complaint, um, which interested readers will see in a, or could see in a forthcoming article in a, in a journal appropriately called Capitalism, semi, uh, no, colon, a journal of history and economics, which is in part a new journal that comes out of Penn. Um, uh, and, and the intent of which I mean, it's in part inspired by the new history of capitalism, but has um, a solid representation of people who, um, of different views. It, and thus, I hope it's a journal that succeeds and that many people take seriously if they're interested in these topics. In any event, that problem of not being able to, to follow developmental trajectories into the contemporary period for which elements that are specific to a some place, be it a world region, be it a country, be it some other spatial unit. I want to be clear and careful that that can have, take on different scales. So I'm not returning us to the tyranny of the national unit. I would merely note that China, in terms of demography and spatial scale, and thus in challenges of both economy and government, is the size of Europe, from the British Isles to the Urals in Russia. Um, and, you know, it's the Han Roman Empire after which, um, you know, Rome falls or you get the Eastern Roman Empire, Byzantine. And so, I mean, there's, there's very different histories of China and Europe that take them out of spatially comparable moments, um, more or less two millennia ago, uh, give or take a few centuries, where they each had 60 million people and similar territories. Today, we have the EU and we have China. And I would say, finally, we can compare China and Europe uh, more usefully. And in fact, that's part of what my work uh, has been doing since 2005. But leaving that issue aside of, of spatial scale, let us simply say that the issue for those of us who study China, and, and for that matter, I'd argue those who study India, and I don't know who everyone else is other than those two constituencies. I see many members of the former and at least one of the latter uh, in our participant list. The issue becomes what features from what periods of Chinese or Indian history do we think still matter for accounting what these places are today in the contemporary capitalist world, which is where Andy was leading us towards in his comments. So if I could just make one pitch for this. In the book, Andy claims that his desire is to show that there is a Oh, I, I, I want to get the language exactly right. So I actually did write all kinds of notes I'm not looking at. So if I can find it, how, what, how do you do this? You do this, um, I just remember, remember it's qualitative convergence and quantitative divergence. So yeah, there's, right. there's, a, there's a notion, in other words, that what um, Ken was studying and what some of the other of us, uh, what Pomerantz was studying and what uh, others of us also have been engaged in um, is noting 
well, and to be clear, well before the work of the 19th, published in the 90s and 2000 and all that period, um, economic historians have been always concerned with what are the causes for what made the rise of Europe. And that the economic part has actually been foundational to our larger set of understandings of what it was to become modern. So in any event, this has been a durable and lasting subject that, is, uh, that has attracted and um, swallowed up uh, several generations of scholars, both in economics, history, and for that matter, social, sociology and other related um, social sciences. But any, uh, uh, swallowed up, just consumed in some sense, uh, intellectually at least. Um, so the, the larger point is that in the reaction that those of us who took in the 90s and 2000s to what we saw about how the European Eurocentric image worked, I fear in a certain sense, what I'm saying is that the global intellectual history is reimposing a kind of Western centric notion of how we get globality, which seems to be profoundly problematic precisely because as um, Professor Leo has pointed out, we know that in economic terms, the path that China took, like other East Asian paths, not that they were all the same, but there are differences, there are variations. And there have been different accommodations made to account for this uh, 20th century and 21st century experiences by both economists, political scientists, historians, I guess some sociologists, but there, there are different literatures. I'm not gonna review those, but I'm just gonna say, we do know this. But the question is, when we turn to intellectual issues, cultural issues, the manner in which we can understand how those might still be consequential, in my opinion, are crucial and they are the most difficult, which is why I've tried to dissuade, um, uh, I can recall at least one or two students of mine, who I've tried to dissuade from tackling this kind of thing because it's so demanding in terms of the intellectual, um, just the depth of erudition you need to be able to distinguish what is new and what is old. In other words, to do this properly, you can't simply look for what's new. You can't simply cherry pick what's new. Um, I could be uh, uh, not playing for the home team and refer to a, someone who used to work at UCLA, uh, but I won't by name, uh, who did literature. And I, it's, it's very hard to identify the, the subject without identifying the individual, but maybe hopefully you haven't read the book. Um, if that's the case, so, but there are any number of examples, I won't use that, but there are any number of examples of people wanting to show what's modern in, in intellectual history, as well as what's in, in, um, in economic history for that matter. And they focus simply on what, uh, in this case, it was a collectania published in the Republican era, and it went through the taxonomy of categories of modern subjects. That collectania had more categories of traditional subjects and not a single one is mentioned. In other words, the taxonomy of what was being published was not simply modern things. It was modern and not modern in the sense that the scholar was concerned. So he didn't even address the others. He just wanted to show what was modern. But if we want to, if we want to capture the intellectual context within which those ideas circulated, we also need to know what else was being circulated. So, to bring this directly to the issues that actually are raised in the book in some sense, but only in the sense of wanting to show the change between early modern and modern, which as Professor Leo said is one of his concerns, um, there is a section in which there is, a, you know, for someone who works on 18th century political economy, something of a rather limited and uh, a summary statement, fair enough for what he's doing, relying on William Rowe's very good book on Chang Mo. Um, he follows Bill, um, Bill Rowe in his, uh, he, he, he takes from Rowe the assessment Rowe makes, which is a very strong assessment that the Chinese concept, concept of Min Shang, uh, a people's livelihood is, I, what, is it, what did Rowe say? Something like it is, I actually quoted it because Andy quotes it in the book. He may remember what it is. I, oh, here it is, somewhere in here. Oh, most basic and pervasive term in Qing political discourse. Well, we don't hear about Minxiang after that um, chapter. But, but just to use this and I'll close, Minxiang, as, as many of us know, and I'm sure Andy of course knows as well, Minxiang is one of Sun, Sun Yat-sen's three principles. 
right? Nationalism, democracy, people's livelihood. Now, people can poo poo that Sun Yat Sen said this, but the ideological vision of what he thought modernity was about for China and how to achieve it, how to be successful at it, included the concept of people's livelihood. Now, people's livelihood is an awkward concept in Western thought. That is, there's no close cognate for that. We can describe it, we can, we can explain what it means in Western categories in terms of how this became an issue, but we can't really use Min Sheng. You would never talk about um, you know, the British concept, um, uh, interpretation of Min Sheng. You would never, any of the things like that. Well, it's not only in the 20th century, um, but I've been recently working, one of my major areas has been on water governance. And both historically and today, uh, it's an it's a ridiculously absurdly large project that I may never finish. But it involves the EU and the US as well. But anyway, the uh, on the Chinese component, China's effort to reform water governance has as its crucial um, reform document. And for those who are familiar with, uh, and I know some people in the audience are with with how uh, PRC politics is organized in terms of how the party, uh, uh, the party and the government administration together issue uh, the number one central document each year, which is a key document of policy, not merely for that year, but it is to identify a policy direction, uh, the intent of which is to create durable change over time through a series of reforms that will be concretely spelled out in later um, statements and are typically preceded by any number of experiments and local uh, efforts to, to respond to certain kinds of um, smaller scale or related subjects that then get crystallized into a major agenda like, like water became. The previous years have all been related to agriculture. Um, the year after 2012, was actually more directed towards, as I recall, it was issues of uh, energy environment, but more air, um, air pollution related than water issues. Anyway, the 2011 document gives us the basic policy line. And when it gets to the issue of what are the main principles motivating this approach, the first principle is Min Sheng. The first principle that we're to understand leads the definition of policies on how water governance has to change has to do with people's livelihood. Now, I'm not saying that minsheng is the same as the minsheng you see in 18th century texts, let alone the very different range of uses that you see in classical texts. It, it, it actually is, it, it has different meanings in, in, in classical texts. That's not the point. The point is that there is a, a concept durable enough to, to move through history, as are, as we know, um, many European concepts, um, to the extent that political theory in an old fashioned intellectual sense still exists in political science departments, you go back to Plato and Aristotle. Uh, we actually now have a, a political theorist trained at Princeton, um, actually a Lebanese, um, Lubna El Amin, who got her advisors at Princeton to allow her to study um, what she thinks of as Confucian political thought as a political theorist who learned enough Chinese, uh, classical Chinese, at least to read text, but to rely mainly on translations, but at least I, I feel has some, at least initial sense of, 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 of some of the logic within which classical Chinese texts are, are of this sort are presented. In any event, um, but typically we don't consider China's classical political theory as political theory. Uh, I could go on with anecdotes about what I've experienced in my career, uh, raising uh, naive questions uh, of people in philosophy about Chinese philosophy and being surprised, being told they were surprised there was Chinese philosophy. This is the uh, English analytic tradition speaking. Anyway, leaving all those kind of weird queries or exchanges aside, the point is, we, there are concepts in Chinese, as there are in European tradition, which are durable enough to trans to to move through time. And the key is that that European concepts also move through space. That's the global one. 
element of which is the global uh, intellectual history we're talking about now. But the, for us who study China, or for that matter, I wonder India, this is an open question, but we need to understand how certain consequential concepts exist, let us minimally say, uh, certainly visible through activism in the 18th century. And I think Bill Rowe's book helps us see in, uh, some of those for sure, but also from that separate cluster of concepts, um, which uh, Professor Liu also looks at from the late 19th century, which is also a major field of study for China historians for many years, including intellectual historians. Um, and, and think of Ben Schwartz's uh, In Search of Wealth and Power, his understanding of Yan Fu's understanding of people like Mill and Smith, uh, which, and Schwartz's account has been subsequently criticized. But he did get right that, that Yan, Fu was, Yan Fu was really a, looking, uh, considering the issue of wealth and power. Wealth and power are nothing but key concepts that go back to early modern European notions of mercantilism. And, and how to power that theme in European history and then how Chinese history in late 19th century are animated by it are crucial to, under, those themes come forward to the present as well. And that's why you, see, you, you could still see um, you know, on uh, what do you call them? The benches all along the streets in, in Chinese cities. At least I remember seeing it in Shanghai within the last few years. There's still some slogan about Fu Chang that, that is, you know, um, part of the current discourse. Now I'm not saying that's the same wealth and power that was intended in late 19th century, but I am saying there is some resonant set of ideas that matters actually to policymakers today. So what does this get us? It gets us that understanding the nature of global capitalism and China's role in it today depends not only understanding how it has embraced things from abroad, be these foreign technologies or foreign ideas, but how those are concretely connected to and sometimes even framed by understandings that, are, that, that owe much to an evolution that occurs more within a tradition than out. Um, uh, one very distinguished, uh, and I say he's distinguished, I've read him, and now I can't remember who I'm talking about. This is not a good sign, but it means I've been talking too long, so I'll stop very shortly because I have to manage time, and I apologize, it's getting late. But anyway, he talks about uh, inheritance, inheritance within rupture. And what he means by that is simply that there are things that carry forward, even though we see the rupture. Um, I'll leave aside the... Uh, the other features of economic history and things, because I've gone on too long, but I hope that at least uh, presents one form of, of um, contextualization for this talk. Uh, with apologies for going too long, I'm going to ask um, Andy if you would please take, um, I think we have time for at least three um, yeah, for sure. uh, questions. Uh, the first is, and this is good, uh, we have um, one on China, one on India, one on China and India, others are coming in, um, and uh, a, a fourth is coming in as well. So quickly, I'm just gonna take these in order. Uh, the first one, Andy, is I am curious about Assamese, uh, uh, text from Assam during this time, uh, perceiving the tea industry, especially since you have a rapid expansion in the 19th century of another exporting industry in Assam, namely crude oil. Um, so sorry, could you, could you say that again? Well, I, I'm going to interpret it or what I understand. Given that Assam in that period is, is especially visible because it's exporting in the global markets for exporting right. oil, how does the view of the tea industry relate to the fact that um, Assam's becoming, uh, developing this export industry in oil, which of course is a new industry? I think that I hope that's the meaning of the question. And if it's not, I trust the yeah. person asking will ask me to rephrase. I'm not, I mean, so Assam is, that oil is like a major sector of the economy and that Assam has always been seen as a reservoir of raw materials, first in tea, now oil. Historically speaking, I don't think oil happens yet. I mean, I, I go through the 1920s, maybe it has, but in my sources, I don't think I read very much about it um, really. Tea is the kind of the predominant, maybe some coal is the predominant industry at the time. Um, so yeah, I didn't see, I didn't see uh, 
historically speaking, I didn't see too much about it. Maybe in the later 20th century, it would come up more. Okay. Right. Uh, let me go on to another question because I apologize I, I went on at such length. Sure, sure. But, um, the, next, the, the next question is, is, could you explain what is the connection between capitalism and industrialization in 19th century Asia, that is in India and China? When, in other words, did China and India actually start their industrializations? Yeah, so I'm assuming their question is about like mechanization, right? Capital intensive um, industry. So the, 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 again, the, the way I'm thinking about capitalism as a social dynamic is that at some point, uh, the, the uh, demand to increase the productivity of human labor becomes a sort of all encompassing thing that, 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 um, that connects people. And mechanization is one obvious solution that, that I think it explains why mechanization is a solution that people arrive at, but then this question of like, well, why do some places mechanize versus others is obviously like the, the big, you know, one of those big questions that have animated for a long time. So I could just say like in the specific case of um, the tea industry, and I think this is true of a lot of other industries at the time, it is, we see this process where in China, they are trying to squeeze as much productivity as possible through labor intensive methods. And that's kind of what I'm tracing with this tea, these tea workshops, right? And then they kind of fall behind and they are feeling the consequences of not being as productive as their competitors. So in that sense, that, 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 is, that is to show kind of what you were saying, Ben, that they are part of the system, that they can't escape the system, that there's consequences to not keeping up. Uh, but, and so rather than saying that this proves they are not capitalist in the sort of developmental sense, um, this actually proves that they are part of a system, they feel the consequences of it. And as a result of those consequences, you do have this, this sort of emergence of Republican era reformers who I think are, despite the sort of like state, non-state split you have in economics, I think it's the reformers who kind of play the role of the industrial, I mean, they work with the industrialists, right? They, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, and this is like the um, kind of tradition from the Republican period into the communist period in China and in Taiwan that the, there's a sort of state industrialist partnership that happens. And just because they're the government doesn't mean that they're not also industrialists. I think the, I think, so rather than saying industrialism only begins when you have these sort of 1930s, 40s efforts to mechanize industries like tea and silk and cotton, rather than saying that that's when it begins, I think you can date it back further. It's, it, it, it begins with when they begin to feel the pressures of international competition that kind of sets the process in motion that culminates with um, the sort of mid 20th century efforts. That's kind of how I began to conceptualize this um, as, I was, as I was thinking about these questions. All right, um, I, I, we have two more questions, uh, both of which I think are very important. The first is, I was wondering if Priscilio could talk more about how and why the finance sector and the compradors became looked down upon by Chinese thinkers since the 1920s. Yeah, right. So good. That's that's a whole chapter. So you could you could check it out that chapter. That and the argument I make, I kind of briefly referred to this at the end, was that the as far as I could tell within literature, people have kind of assumed that the anti-compradorial thought of like the Mao period was really this product of 1940s Communist Party ideology. It was about uh, nationalism. It was about calling them traitors for collaborating with foreigners. And that's certainly part of it. But I think the deeper transformation is the 1910s and 20s, you have this rethinking of economics, or at least at the mainstream elite level, where, as I mentioned before, through the late 19, 19th century, it's very mercantilist, as Ben was talking about with, with Yan Fu and uh, people like Zheng Guanying, who are very much concerned with trade and winning these trade wars. Um, and they're beginning to think about production, but it's not really central to their way of thinking. By the time of the 20s, you begin to see Chinese thinkers who foreground in order for China to become strong and to fight off the imperialists, we need to revolutionize production itself. And once production is kind of placed into the center of one's economic vision, then finance and commerce, they are no longer seen as a sort of protagonist of the economy. They're kind of seen as parasites who, who are sort of, as a secondary effect, are creaming profits off of the, pr the productive sectors, which is labor and industrialization, right? So um, in, a, in a broad sense, I think what's interesting is you know, the compradors, the financial sector, they're kind of just doing the same thing for 30 or 40 years. Um, so which, what has transformed is not so much what they're doing, what transforms is how does mainstream economic thought in China view them? 
set, like how, how has mainstream economic thought itself changed over those 30, 40 years? So I thought that was, what I was trying to argue is we can use this to kind of index a transformation, a sort of consciousness um, um, among at least the sort of elite economic uh, thinkers within China at this, at this sort of early 20th century period. And our last question um, uh, is, is uh, uh, very serious and also uh, pays you a uh, great tribute. Um, by a, a very senior historian. Uh, the question is, your admirable book, Foregrounds, a concept of labor-intensive capital and accumulation derived from the classical Marxian analysis, but it also resonates with the Wallerstinian concept of capitalism as a process of spatial integration into the modern world system. How would you situate your work relative to Wallerstein's analysis and his depiction of a global division of labor and the periphery subordination to it? Yeah. So, yeah. so thanks for bringing this up. Cause this is also, I think it's as one, one of the um, things I was thinking when you were speaking, which is uh, so, yeah, I mean, thanks for, thanks for the compliment and thanks for recognizing that strand of thought. And actually my advisor at Columbia was, was the late Adam McCune. I did work with Maddie, but oh, also Adam McCune. Oh. And Adam was very much a Wallerstinian. Okay. No, 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 yeah. <laughs> and um, Adam, but I've actually gotten questions about why don't I talk about Wallerstein more? And it might be because Adam was such a Wallerstinian that I just kind of, you know, as you, as you do with your advisor, you don't want to necessarily talk about what your advisor likes, you know? And, um, but I do, I mean, I think at a conceptual level, there are similarities and I really actually came to appreciate Wallerstein after I finished the doctorate. Um, but I think there are some differences. And I think the basic one is that um, as, as, as Ben was saying, you know, Wallerstein's conception is as, as the 19th and 20th century goes along, the periphery joins the European world system. And the way I was kind of conceptualizing, and I think I say this explicitly in the book at one point, as these ideas to get to your intellectual history question, as these ideas begin to get translated and played around with in, in China and India, it's not that, that China is becoming more Western in my view, it's more that political economy itself is getting less Eurocentric and is becoming, I don't wanna say it's more Asiafied or more Sinicized, but it is becoming much more, much less tethered to its origin, let's say in you know, 18th century Scotland, and it's becoming this global language. Um, now you could talk about is it ultimately still an imperialist project of its European in origin and so on. Uh, but I think if we take seriously this idea that these ideas resonate because of the material, they resonate materially before they resonate intellectually, which is kind of my viewpoint, then I think we don't necessarily have to make that to say like, well, China's Eurocentric because they're using Adam Smith, right? It's just that Adam Smith itself parts of Adam Smith were kind of speaking to a sort of universal language of how capitalism would function in other parts of the world. Um, so, to, so that's on one basic level in terms of, obviously I'm not a big fan of Wallerstein's kind of latent Eurocentrism. And the other aspect I would say is Wallerstein does do, a, I think a good job of emphasizing that, well, so his is ultimately a world market conception that does pay attention to different labor forms. Um, but I don't think he, I think labor is too much of a secondary concern for him. I think he's very good at recognizing, you know, you have, you have slavery and peasant labor that um, are compatible with capitalism. But I think he doesn't take seriously that in a situation like Indian tea versus Chinese tea, we have processes that are being powered by non-proletarian, non-classical forms of labor, and they're in competition with each other. And in this particular case, they are the protagonists. They're the ones driving forward this story. And we have to take seriously that sort of um, that tension that is that is produced with competition, as opposed to sort of you know, his, his depiction is almost a sort of almost too smooth, peaceful system, world system without all this sort of ruptures and breaks and trends and sort of constantly shifting units of analysis um, within the world system. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I like Wallerstein a lot. I think he was very good. I just think, you know, we could use him to build on and, and create more complex, um, um, complex, complex and particular histories. I believe uh, it's five, 31, I think we're supposed to, it, uh, someone, one of the um, uh, leaders at CCS can uh, tell me if I'm wrong. Are, are we, do we go an hour and a half or do we go, I, I, is it an hour and a half? Andy, what were we told? I should remember. I was um, told 90 minutes, but yeah, I don't. That's what I thought. So yeah. I wanted, I, I, I didn't want to cut you off and I certainly have no, anything fine. I would say or invite others to uh, ask, but um, I believe I'm supposed to now thank you because this was a very harmonious note you managed to channel through your um, your late advisor um, back to Wallerstein, and and uh, even though you disagree with some of his ideas, which I certainly do as well, um, you find a gracious way to incorporate them, which is 
uh, better than I <laughs> actually treated you in my uh, uh, rather grumpy remarks in, at points. So thank you very much for um, a very engaging talk. I think we had a huge audience. I think uh, Michael may want to uh, close. Uh, so I'll just thank you and, and say it was a very uh, stimulating afternoon and I hope everyone who's attended has enjoyed it. Yeah, I'll just join in in thanking you, Andrew, for a very stimulating talk. Thanks to all of our audience members. And again, check our website. We have more events coming up and we look forward to seeing many of you online. Stay safe, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Bye. We'll stop the recording.